So I hope you all can stick with us. I know it's a long day. I know we're running a little bit over, so we're going to get started. So we're going to talk today about an 18-year-old patient who comes in who has a history of Crohn's disease. Her past medical history is significant for juvenile idiopathic arthritis that was diagnosed at quite a young age, as well as asthma. She comes into clinic, and she complains of worsening abdominal pain that's been going on for a week. She's reporting six to seven liquid to soft stools every day with blood. She has some nausea, but no vomiting. She says her appetite's pretty good. She hasn't lost any weight yet. She's not had fever. But oh, by the way, she had a reported Klebsiella stool infection at an outside hospital the week before and was treated with trimethoprine, sulfamethazole. And her last infliximab infusion was four weeks ago, following which she was doing quite well. So she's on quite a lot of medications with her combined conditions of IBD and JIA. She's on infliximab, five milligrams every eight weeks. She had already been, um, prior to her diagnosis of IBD, had already been on methotrexate for her JIA at 25 milligrams every seven days. She's also on Sarcomyces boulardii. Uh, probiotic. She's on esomeprazole every day, and then she had previously been on the trimethoprim. It's also important to note, in addition for her medications for allergies and asthma, some iron and folic acid, she's also on Selendac and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory twice a day for her joint disease. On exam, her vitals are normal. She's pretty well appearing. She has a normal appearing abdomen with good bowel sounds. There's really no concerning findings on her abdominal exam. Her joint exam is actually a little bit more impressive with her arthritis, with some knee swelling. But otherwise, there's really not much to remark on on her physical exam. For laboratory evaluations, you find that she has an elevated CRP, albumin borderline low, and she has iron deficiency anemia, as well as elevated platelets. All of her other laboratory evaluations serologically were normal. So what is on our differential diagnosis? And of course, we could cast a very broad net, but just kind of thinking about what are the things we should be thinking about in this patient. Of course, we need to be thinking about IBD flare and loss of response to therapy. This is particularly challenging in our patients who have other comorbid conditions, and particularly in our patients with JIA. Is this joint swelling and pain that she's experiencing due to her underlying JIA, or is this indicative of an IBD-associated arthropathy and indicating a loss of response? Could this be a CMV colitis? She is on the Selendac. Should we be thinking about an NSAID gastritis? Or is this Clostridium difficile? So oh, we find that our patient has Clostridium difficile confirmed by t toxin B PCR positivity. So what I want to convey to you today is what a significant health burden this is. It is the leading cause of hospital-associated gastrointestinal illnesses in the United States, and it's an increasing cause of community-associated GI diseases. Annual costs are estimated to be $3.2 billion annually. And what's more concerning is that rates have been rising since 2000. Data from 2011 show that there were an estimated 500,000 infections and 29,000 associated deaths. About uh, three-fifths of these cases are healthcare associated, and almost 200,000 are community-associated cases of Clostridium difficile. So what about the mechanisms of disease and host response? So we all learned about C. diff in medical school and microbiology, but just to remind you all, it is a disease that is caused by enterotoxin A and cytotoxin B, which have been shown to interfere with protein syn synthesis and lead to cell membrane disruption and cell death. We also see that there is a host immune response to the toxin that may predict who develops symptoms, because we know that about 5% of all individuals are colonized with C. diff. In addition, we see that there is a development of immunoglobulin G antibodies against toxin A that may help contribute to this asymptomatic state, as individuals who are asymptomatic have high immunoglobulin levels um, and a decreased risk factor of recurrent C. diff by a factor of 44. So some really impressive statistics there. <clears throat> 
We've also seen an emergence of new strains, in particular the NAP1B1027, which is a hypervirulent strain and unfortunately exhibits quinolone resistance. It also produces a binary toxin that enables more production of toxins A and B. And we think that in addition, the increased use of quinolones in community infections may have contributed to strain selection. In addition, we know that Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, our patients are faced with a higher risk of C. difficile, and we've seen that borne out in the recent studies, which have shown a significant increase in C. difficile in our inflammatory bowel disease patients. Furthermore, these patients are also at high risk for recurrent C. diff, which we see in up to one-third of children and adults who have, re have C. diff. We also know that there's been a significant increase in hospitalization rates for young adults with IBD and Clostridium difficile with five-fold increase between 1997 and 2011. This is compared to less than doubling of hospitalization rates for patients with IBD who are not found to be C. diff positive. So what medications are associated with Clostridium difficile? We certainly know many of the antibiotics, clindamycin is notorious, fluoroquinolone, sulfamethoxol, trimethoprine, corticosteroids, or all of the above. Anybody have a sense? All of the above, right. So let's talk a little bit about general risk factors for Clostridium difficile in the general population. And we all sort of think about what are the traditional risk factors that we learned about. We all know that antibiotic use, the number of antibiotics, the duration of antibiotics, advanced age over 65, hospitalization more recently or a prolonged hospitalization, immunosuppressive therapies can increase our risk, comorbidities, we know from more recent data that the proton pump inhibitors are also a risk factor, nasogastric tubes. But what about risk factors for our patients with IBD? And what's really interesting is that they're not exactly the same. We actually have found that antibiotic use is a lot less important of a risk factor in our patients with IBD. In fact, we found that antibiotic use preceding C. diff infection in IBD patients is less common in only 40% of IBD patients compared to 69% in our non-IBD patients. And in fact, 40% of our patients with IBD who develop C. diff report no antibiotic use at all. So these are patients who may not present with the traditional risk factors, which is something important to keep in mind when you think about who deserves testing. We also know that the advanced age that we often see in our patients who develop C. diff without IBD, average age of CD I and IBD cohorts is significantly lower. So this is a real challenge because we have a real balancing act here. Because our patients with IBD require immune suppression, which we know is, can be a risk factor. The data is a little bit unclear, but we do know that maintenance immunosuppressive therapy is associated with a two-fold risk increase in Clostridium difficile. However, we haven't found any association between immunosuppressive therapy and heightened C. diff risk in our ulcerative colitis patients. We also know that corticosteroids may increase the risk of infection, and in fact, steroid initiation at the time of C. diff in increases the risk of C. diff by a factor of three. And the fact that IBD itself is a risk factor for Clostridium difficile, with patients experience a three-fold increased risk compared to non-IBD patients. So just a little bit more about the challenges that we face. We know that sometimes the symptoms of Clostridium difficile are indistinguishable from a flare of IBD. And we also know that these pseudomembranes shown in this nice endoscopic image are really present in only about 13% of our patients. So who should we test? Well, this is pretty clear. We really shouldn't be testing patients who are not having diarrhea. And diarrhea, by the current guidelines, is defined as more than three liquid stools per day. Okay? In fact, most of the standard PCR tests for C. diff toxin, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, require that the stool be liquid in order for the test to be run. We should be thinking about testing all hospitalized patients with IBD who are presenting with an acute flare that looks like colitis. 
we should be testing ambulatory patients who develop di diarrhea even with no known risk factors if they have underlying IBD. And we should be testing our patients who've had colectomy and a pouch that are symptomatic. And we also need to remember that in patients with severe colitis, treatment with empiric therapy against C. diff may be important and need to coincide with treatment of the IBD flare while we wait for results. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the options. I think most of us are pretty aware of them. There are the nucleic acid amplification tests, which are the PCRs for the toxin genes, which have the best sensitivity and highest specificity at 199%. This is far superior to our enzyme assays, which are really fallen out of favor and are really should only be used as part of a testing algorithm. It is important to remember that there is a risk of false positive after treatment or in asymptomatic patients, which reinforces the fact that we should not be testing patients who are not symptomatic, and we shouldn't be testing patients who've been treated unless they develop a recurrence of your symptoms. There's also the GDH screening, which is best used in testing algorithms, but is unable to distinguish between toxigenic and non-toxigenic strains. So how would you treat your first infection? metronidazole, vancomycin, our new friend on the block, fidoxamycin, of course, one of the areas that I'm most interested in, fecal microbiota transplantation. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of data about how to treat our IBD patients who develop CDI, so much of the data I'm presenting is based on recommendations for patients who don't have underlying IBD. But just as a general guideline, our patients with mild to moderate disease can be treated with metronidazole, or vancomycin with standard dosing as shown up, uh, on this slide. Patients with severe disease should receive high-dose vancomycin or vancomycin in combination with metronidazole. And these reviews on um, references here below have very nice definitions for what are the definitions of moderate, mild, and severe. In addition, we may need to be thinking that our IBD patients should be treated with vancomycin as a first-line therapy, although the evidence to support this is still needed. And we do have the risk of selecting for vancomycin-resistant enterococci if we use those treatment modalities. We also need to think about discontinuing the antibiotic that may be causing it and whether it was really necessary in the first place. I'm not advocating that you stop antibiotics in a patient who clearly needs them. I'm just reminding us to be thinking about antibiotic choices in patients who have high risk for C. diff. We need to be continuing their immunosuppressive medications, and we want to try to avoid escalation during the acute phase of therapy. So our patient received... Uh, metronidazole initially for four days and had no improvement and was subsequently transitioned to vancomycin and then became asymptomatic and unfortunately had repeat testing, but uh, the repeat testing confirmed that the C. diff was not, no longer present. One month later, she returns to clinic. She this time is admitted. She's having 10 moderately bloody stools per day, worsening abdominal pain that's crampy. Again, no fever. She has some nausea, and she had emesis in the ER times one. So what do we think is wrong? She's developed recurrent C. diff, which is, as we say here, a really recurring problem. So we know that after you've had one recurrence of C. diff, of subsequent recurrences go up every time. And after your initial treatment of CDI, you have about 10 to 20% chance of recurrence within eight weeks. After your first recurrence, it's astounding. Your rates of recurrence go to 40 to 65%. There's a little bit of confusion about whether this is due to the same strain, whether you've actually cleared the infection or not but it's clear that this is a really big problem, and it's likely due to the antibiotics as well as alteration in the gut microbiota. So CDI again, no easy answers. For the first recurrent, the current recommendations are to treat again with the same regimen. A second recurrent should be treated with a pulsed or tapered vancomycin course. You should know that there is no, optimal, no consensus on optimal courses for this vancomycin regimen for tapering course. And in severe cases, we should be using vancomycin and calling our surgical colleagues. For more than three recurrences, you need to think about fecal microbiota transplantation. This is, involves the transplantation of the entire microbiome from a healthy donor to an individual with C. diff. This seems to be very effective for our patients who have refractory or recalcitrant traces cases. And as you know, we know that we're seeing much higher rates of metronidazole treatment failures since 2000.
So just a little bit about fecal microbiota transplantation for CDI. The retrospective studies have very impressive success rates from at least 85 to 95 percent. And we even have a more recent uh, prospective trial by Van Nude and colleagues that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and halted early due to the superiority of FMT to vancomycin and bilavage or bilavage alone. FMT also appears to be safe and effective in children, and we have pr provided this treatment to a number of children at the University of Chicago. We're one of the only treatment centers that offers FMT to children with recurrent C. diff. But it is important to remember that this treatment may have additional risk for patients with IBD. It will certainly clear the C. diff, but it may predispose your patient to a flare or worsening to disease. So this is not something that should be taken without thoughtful consideration, and certainly shouldn't be considered with unless you're discussing with experts in the field. There was a case published by our colleague Colleen Kelly at Brown, who had a patient with quiescent ulcerative colitis in remission for 20 years, got recurrent C. diff, had a fecal transplant, and then developed a subsequent flare. So just something to think about. So as I wrap up, I want to just give you some important take-home points. Clostridium difficile is on the rise, both in the hospital and in the community. And in our C. difficile patients who have underlying deep IBD, they are at increased risk. These risk factors are not the same as we see in the community, and they may not have the traditional risk factors, and that shouldn't impact your uh, testing. We also know that CDI presents unique and serious problems for our patients with IBD and that the treatment really needs to be tailored to each individual patient. Always use your antibiotics judiciously and always wash your hands in just a little plug to remember that hand sanitizer is not effective against Clostridium difficile due to the spores. These are highly resistant to heat, chemicals, bleach, you name it. So these patients are colonized. Once the patient gets in the hospital with CDI, the risk of it spreading throughout the hospital is increased, so you guys need to be washing your hands, encouraging your staff to wash their hands, warm soapy water, okay? And I'd just like to thank everybody, in particular my co-presenter from this morning, uh, Dr. Shive Siva, and um, our medical student who's working with us this summer, Sophia Bellerwin-Warren. Thank you for your attention.